for joining us today here at Cornerstone Church. We are a church that loves God and loves others. If you have any questions or would like to find out more, check us out online at bethalthachurch.com. We'd also love to connect with you in person. Cornerstone Church meets every Sunday morning at 1010 in Bethalta, Illinois. We look forward to seeing you. And now, on to the message. Remember picking teams in grade school or in junior high. Remember that? Recess, yeah. The, those days when you were um, <laughs> forced by your gym teacher to divide yourselves fairly and evenly. <laughs> Remember that? I, I, was, uh, I, was, I know some of you, this will shock you. I, I was not the most athletic uh, child uh, when I was in uh, grade school and in junior high. So for me, Team captains and picking teams was not uh, my favorite experience at recess or in gym class. Um, For me, I spent my time uh, waiting to be picked, praying that I would not be the last one picked. Do you know what I mean? Like that was the ultimate hierarchy, wasn't it? The pecking order in school, who got picked last. Um, Every once in a while, you'd run into a gym teacher or another teacher or coach who would try to help at the end. You know, you'd have like six kids left, and the gym teacher would say, you know, okay, you three go over here, and you three go over there. And that was kind of a way for the gym teacher to try to say, we don't want one person to feel left out. No, you just made six kids feel left out. Thank you very much, right? I, um, I didn't like being on the other end either, though. There were times when I was, you know, the team captain, and I had to pick the team, and that was nerve-wracking, because you, you got to pick a team where you're going to win, but then you got all those other poor kids in there that just were going to be picked last. You know, some of them might have even been your friends. You know, so what do you do when in, that, in that situation? I mean, you've got to pick Josh, right? You know who Josh is. Josh is the kid in fifth grade that has the physique of a college quarterback and the arm to show it, right? Um, And so you have to pick Josh because you got to have him on your team because you you got to be able to win. So you pick Josh first, and then you have have to determine, do you do the real picks or do you do the pity picks? Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, you got Jimmy over there in the corner who still has the rubber ball indentation from when Josh drilled him in dodgeball last week. And he's crying because he wants to be on your team. He doesn't even want to be on your team. He doesn't want to be on the opposite team of Josh and be sent to the nurse again, right? Like these are the problems that you have as a child and in middle school when you're picking teams. Now, look, now, really, when you pick teams in in school and stuff, it's pretty inconsequential because, you know, it's going to last the duration of gym class. It's going to last the, the duration of recess. And then you're done, right? You move on. You know, sure, there might be a story for a few weeks of that one game or that thing that happened, but tomorrow you're going to have totally different teams. You know, in life, um, we don't really pick teams when we grow up, really, in life as we get older and as we experience the real world, but as we travel through life, we bump shoulders with and interact with all sorts of different kinds of people, right? Uh, you know, if we're going to use that, that, meant, that uh, analogy of dodgeball, uh, some people can throw and some people can't throw. <laughs> some people can catch and other people can't catch. Some people have baggage from previous games. And so as we interact with people, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, who are we interacting with and how are we interacting with them? It's much more complex in real life than it is just with dodgeball. In real life, people have baggage. People have problems and pains, and they have personalities, and they have agendas and desires and certain inclinations. And so we need to ask ourselves, how do we navigate relationships? How, how do we approach life when uh, we've been offended by someone? Or when we come upon a situation where two people are having issues or problems? Uh, how do we deal with a society that likes to rank us and put us in different positions? I'm better than you, I'm farther along than you, I'm in, I'm, you're out, this is here, this is there. Like, how do we deal with all these different questions and these challenges we have in society today? How do we deal with the broken relationships that are around us? I think we're going to find some answers to these questions in our text today. Um, if you've been here at all over the last several months, you know that throughout most of this year, we've been slowly making our way through the New Testament letter of Colossians. Uh, This is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote 
around the year A.D. 60, and he is writing it to a church in the city of Colossae, and the main idea of this letter is that Christ is supreme. All throughout, Paul is constantly pointing the attention of his readers to Christ. Jesus is before all. He is the creator. He is in all and through all. He is supreme. And today in our text, the Apostle Paul is kind of getting near the end. Chapter 4 is the last chapter of this letter. And he is, if you will, Paul is sharing, um, he's identifying a couple of the people that he has on his team. Two men in particular. And, And what Paul says about these men and how he interacts with them and what he sees in these men and how they're interacting with others is very telling to us about how we need to handle the relationships that we come across in our lives. So the first guy that is named in this passage is a man named Tychicus, okay? We're going to have a few kind of weird uh, first century names here today that we're going to talk about. So just bear with me. This guy's name is Tychicus. It says this in verse 7. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. Now, we really don't know much about Tychicus. Uh, He is named in the Bible five times, and uh, each time he's named, it's just a sentence or a couple of sentences. We don't have a very big picture of him, but we can kind of draw some conclusions, and we know a few things about him. Uh, We're pretty sure that Tychicus is from the city of Ephesus. And uh, Paul did a a, a missionary journey to Ephesus, and we believe that Tychicus was a convert of Paul while he was in Ephesus, and uh, eventually became part of Paul's team. He's one of Paul's traveling companions. Uh, We know this for at least, that he followed Paul on his missionary journeys for at least a short time, but we think it might have been longer, but we know there was at least a small window where he was there. Uh, Tychicus became a very trusted member of Paul's team. Paul sent him, like he's doing here in Colossians, to deliver letters on his behalf. At one point, he actually is responsible for an offering that is taken for a group of people who are in need. And so Tychicus has kind of, he he, he kind of shows up at the end of Paul's ministry, and he plays a really big, important role near the end of that. So that's what Tychicus is doing here. He's, He's delivering this letter to the church in Colossae, and he's bringing news about Paul's situation. Look at how Paul describes him. He has three terms. A dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant. So Paul clearly has an appreciation for this man, uh, even an affection and a respect for him. He continues on in verse 8 and says this, I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. So Tychicus is delivering this letter, but he kind of tells, it it sounds like he's telling Tychicus, hey, fill in the gaps if they have questions about this letter, but also tell them about me. Remember, Paul's in prison here, and Paul is uh, suffering because because he's been preaching the gospel, and the church at Colossae want to know what one of their leaders is experiencing. Uh, In those days, when you went to prison, uh, it wasn't usually a sentence. Typically, prison was like a holding period before they sentenced you. And so they're waiting to know what's going on with, with Paul's situation, what's going to happen to him. But Paul also anticipates that Tychicus will minister to them. He says that, they may encourage, that he may encourage their hearts. So even though Paul is the apostle and he's the letter writer, he says that uh, Tychicus is going to minister to you. He kind of elevates Tychicus in their eyes, who they haven't met. And he says, look, this guy's a minister. He's going to care for you. He's going to encourage you. Now, if Paul was picking teams, Tychicus would have been the Josh, okay? Tychicus would have been the guy. Like, if we were picking a team to, to have in, in life or in ministry, Tychicus is the guy. He was an eager convert. Convert. He was loyal, and he was faithful. He, he served Paul in a variety of different ways. You know, Paul's in prison for preaching the gospel, and Tychicus is doing gospel work on behalf of Paul. I mean, he's putting his own neck out on the line for his sake. Tychicus is the kind of guy, I think, that we would all want to hang out, someone who's loyal and encouraging and supportive of us. Now, that's Tychicus, but there's another man that Paul mentions in our passage here, and it's another guy named Onesimus. Paul says this in verse 9. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. Now, this seems pretty straightforward, and it actually sounds a little bit like what he says about Tychicus. But 
one particular part of what Paul says here it would, would really have shocked the readers at Colossae. I think there were some jaws that were dropping when they got to this part of the letter as it was read out loud to them. That's because Tychicus and Onesimus have two completely different roles in their society. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about uh, the Roman Empire in the first century, okay? And we talked about the house. Remember, there were these household codes. There was an expectation of the way the house was formed. Uh, Philosophers like Aristotle would talk about this. And they had these kind of structure that you had to live in. And if you lived in the structure, then the, emperor, the, emperor, the, the whole empire would be stable because the home was stable. And it was a patriarchal stu- structure. The head of the household was a male, and he was on top. And he had authority over the wife, and he had authority over the children, and he had authority over the slaves. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about how Paul addresses this. He sees the problems in this system, and he injects the gospel into it to try to subvert it. The reality is, is that this structure was was an ironclad structure in their day. Emperors ruled and slaves did the work. The men were the head of the home and the slaves did their work in the home. Uh, it It was a way to keep the whole empire secure. And Tychicus and Onesimus are from two different levels in the hierarchy. Paul calls Onesimus a dear brother. And this would have surprised the readers of his day because Onesimus was a slave. You wouldn't speak about a slave in these terms and call him a brother. Now, I told you that we know about Tychicus from five verses in the New Testament. It's very little. But we actually know more about Onesimus because there's another letter that Paul wrote. We think it traveled with this letter to Colossae. And that letter is called Philemon. And in that letter to Philemon, the head of a house... In that church in Colossae, Paul writes about his slave, Onesimus. So for Paul to mention this and for Onesimus to stand there, the people in the church would have been a little bit confused about what Paul is saying. By calling him dear brother, Paul is elevating this slave and raising his status up. And this is significant. Paul picks someone with considerable baggage to be on his team. He embraces this slave and invites him in. And really, this shouldn't, this shouldn't surprise us because this is part of the theme of what Paul has been talking about in this letter. The previous chapter in verse 11, he said this, Here in the church, there is no Gentile or Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, no barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So Paul declares that in Christ, all barriers and labels that society gives are obsolete. They're obsolete. And the people at the church in Colossae, they would have known this about Onesimus. They would have known he was a slave because he was from that city. Paul says he is one of you. Now, in other words, Onesimus is returning with Tychicus and this letter to the city. So we could ask ourselves this question. Why did Onesimus leave? Did Philemon, his master, know that Paul needed some help? So he sent his, his servant out to go serve Paul? Or maybe, he, maybe Onesimus was out just doing work and he ran into Paul and built this relationship with. Neither of those things happened. The reason why Onesimus is returning is because Onesimus left when he ran away from his master. Now this is serious business in the first church. This is punishable of death kind of business in those days. You didn't have to punish him by death, but certainly the punishment could have and would have been severe. And so Imagine the church in Colossae, their response and their surprise when Paul welcomes them back and he says, uh, welcome him, he is our faithful brother, our dear and faithful brother. I mean, I think the people in the church would have been like, what is going on? Is Paul crazy? Look, if the Colossians were picking teams, they would pick Tychicus, but I don't think after he ran away from his master that they would be picking Onesimus. But what Paul does here is really, really beautiful. He picks both. He calls them both dear brothers and faithful. Now, what we see here in this one phrase, our faithful and dear brother, I think, is the practical outflow of our faith in Jesus. You know, we talk about this a lot here at Cornerstone, but you weren't saved and forgiven just to be set aside and isolated from, you know, the world around you. You weren't touched by the gospel to be out of touch with society Our faith in Christ should compel us to live and to act differently, to look past 
cultural expectations and challenges in order to, to call slaves brothers. That's the power of the gospel in and at work in us and through us. You know, but I find that, unfortunately, even in the church, most people are content to stick with the Tychicuses of the world, to build relationships with those people and to pick them. We opt for those people that are easy to relate to, and we surround ourselves with people that don't have baggage or at least aren't showing their baggage, right? Because all of us have our junk. Some of us are just better at hiding it. You know, calling slaves brothers is uh, no easy task. But what does this look like? I want to take a few minutes to illustrate this. And we're going to do this uh, by looking at that letter that Paul wrote to Philemon in just a minute. But before we get to there, I want to, I want to ultimately contrast that with another letter that was written in the first century. Now, we're going to get into a couple weird names here again, but bear with me. Um, I think when, you, when we get to the end of this, I think you'll see kind of why we're taking this little uh, journey here around the corner here. We're going to take a little bit of rabbit, rabbit trail here. But there is another letter that was written in the first century, just a little bit after Paul, um, that is not part of the Bible. But I think it's really telling and it's really revealing about the culture and the society of that day. It's really powerful in how it's different than what Paul says to Philemon. And this is a letter by a man named Pliny, Pliny the Younger, that he wrote to another man called Sabinianus. Okay, so bear with me here. I've got a little chart on the screen here. Um, you've got this guy named Pliny, Pliny the Younger, and he was a senator. At one point in his life, he was a lawyer and he was a, a politician. He was a very important figure. He was well-known. Uh, we have some different writings that he had. Archaeologists have found these different letters. And so he wrote a letter to a man named Sabinianus, and it was about a freed man. You notice at the bottom there, it says freed man. We don't have his name. He's not even named in this letter that he's written. Uh, we believe he was a former slave of Sabinianus. And throughout this letter, he talks to Sabinianus about how he should react. We don't know what happened, but this freed man did something to offend or to make uh, Sabinianus angry. And so what you have is you have someone in society, near the top of society, telling someone that's the head of a house, below him in society, what to do about a freed man who is below that person. And he says things like this. He said, look, I know that this freed man really made you upset, and I know you have every right to punish him. But I'll tell you what, it's not good for your heart, you're just your personality, you know, you don't do well with anger, so just why don't you show him mercy? Because if you show him mercy, other people, then they'll, they'll see that and it'll be virtuous. People will, oh, look at the mercy you're showing this freed man of yours that's still in your house. Because the challenge in those days is even if you were a slave, you could sometimes earn your freedom through paying it off. Maybe, uh, we don't know if Sabinianus allowed him to, to pay his his, this freed man to pay his way out, or maybe Sabinianus was just nice and made him a free man. But once he was free, it wasn't like he could go anywhere. He was still under that household. He was still dependent on him. And so Pliny says to him, you know, just be virtuous. People will, it, it'll be magnanimous of you. People will acknowledge that. And besides, I've talked with him. I've given him a good stern talking to. He's really sorry. And if he does something else again, you could just be, you'll be doubly justified at that point, and then you can really lay the boom on him, okay? That's what he basically says. At the end of this letter, the hierarchy is in place. Pliny's at the top. Sabinianus is there still. I mean, yeah, he's showing mercy, but it's really benefiting uh, uh, Sabinianus, and the freedman is still near the bottom. Now, let's compare that to Paul's letter to Philemon. And if you have the Bible app out, I have the whole uh, letter of Pliny in there if you want to read it for yourself. There's a similar structure here. Paul the Apostle is at the top. He's at the, higher, the high end of the authority ladder when it comes to the church. Uh, Philemon is the head of the house. And according to Roman society, he's got the power over everybody. He's got the authority. And then you have Onesimus, the slave, the runaway slave, which is like below slave status there. But the approach that Paul takes is significantly different. In Philemon, it's, it's only one chapter. In verses 8 and 9, it says this. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you, Philemon, to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Do you see what Paul's doing here? It's very subtle, but it's really powerful. He acknowledges the culture and the status, and he goes, look, I'm at the top here, and I could order you what to do. I could tell you how to do things. He said, but instead, what I want to do is I want to appeal to you on the basis of love. Paul doesn't lord himself over 
this head of a house. But instead, what does he do? He lowers himself down, brings him down, himself down to Philemon's uh, level, and he reaches around, puts his arm around him, and says, hey, Philemon, let's talk. I'm coming to you as a friend. I'm coming to you as someone that loves you and is in relationship with you. Yes, I'm an apostle, but I'm not doing it that way. I'm doing it this way. And he goes on, and he begins to talk about Onesimus in the next verses. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in change. So he's, he's in prison. He gets in contact with Onesimus, and he builds this relationship with him where Onesimus, he considers him to be his son. Verse 11, formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Uh, just a side note here, Onesimus' name means useful, Mr. Useful. And so Paul is doing a little play on words here. And then verse 12, I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. So what does Paul do here with Onesimus? He reaches down to this runaway slave and he raises him up and loves him and he reaches his arm around him and says, Onesimus, let's talk. Paul pulls them in, and this is no easy thing for Paul to do. I mean, this is a dangerous situation with him and Onesimus because if Philemon wants to press charges, Paul is now implicating himself in this relationship with this runaway slave. And so Paul could have refused to help. Uh, Paul could have uh, maybe tried to get Onesimus to escape. He could have found another way out. He could have just been passive aggressive and stepped away. But Paul does the hard thing and he reaches out to Philemon and he reaches out to Onesimus in an act of reconciliation between the two. At the end of the letter, the hierarchy is changed. This is the power of the gospel in our society and in our culture where there's this hierarchy in the first century and it shifts now, and everyone is on the same playing field. Now, Paul doesn't tell Philemon to set Onesimus free because that doesn't really get to the heart of the issue. Outward action doesn't change the heart of the society. Slavery was pervasive in that culture. There are some estimates that up to one-third of the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. And so instead of trying to go from the outside and, and blow up a system that would probably create even more problems, Paul tries to inject the gospel into the very structure itself by changing the dynamics from within at the local level to be able to bring disruption to the whole empire. Now, where does Paul learn this kind of idea of bringing people together and trying to be an agent of reconciliation? Well, he learns it from Jesus, doesn't he? Throughout Jesus' life, Jesus says things like this in John 10. He says, I and the Father are one. I and the Father, we have relationship with one another. The Father loves me, and I remain in him, he says in John 15. Jesus embraced God the Father and was in constant relationship with him. But his life also shows us how he embraced humanity, doesn't it? I mean, the very act of Jesus leaving heaven to come to be with us is an act of embrace, is it not? Isn't this what he was showing us through his teaching, through his miracles, through the healings that he performed, that he was embracing us as well? You look, Jesus was the point of reconciliation there. At some point, Onesimus decided to do his own thing. He looked at his master, and whether he said it or not, he said in his mind or verbally, he said, I don't want to do what Philemon is telling me to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm not going to do your will anymore, Philemon. I'm going to leave. We all are like Onesimus, aren't we? The Scriptures says that clearly over and over and over again. We are all Onesimuses. We are all people who have said to God, not your will be done, but my will be done. I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to go run away. Now, Onesimus had Paul to bring back the two together. And fortunately for us, we have Jesus, who is the agent of reconciliation between us and God. Jesus came to live the life we couldn't live. He died the death that we deserve to experience the forgiveness that we didn't earn. He stretched out his arms to embrace us, so that we could be reconciled to God. He very literally stretched out his arms on the cross in an act of reconciliation for us. Now, as we close with these thoughts, I want to share another letter that Paul wrote, just a couple of verses from this. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes, and he talks about this idea of reconciliation and the role that Christ plays. He says this in verse 16, From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. In other words, we don't look at the structures of society, who's in, who's out, 
Jew or Gentile, slave or free, but instead, we don't look in that point of view. He says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do, we do so no longer. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I mean, who would have thought in this little verse that we see, some names that we don't understand, Paul says, Look, there's this guy, Tychicus, and he's great. He's, our, he's a faithful, dear brother and a servant. And then he talks about Onesimus, and the jaws of the people would have dropped. And Paul wraps his arms around not just Philemon and Onesimus, but he wraps his arms around Onesimus and the church as well. And he serves as an, act of, an agent of reconciliation for them. You know, we talked about teams at the beginning and the people that we interact with. And church, I know it's easy for us to hang around with the Tychicuses. We need those people in our life. We need to have those kinds of people that support us and encourage us, that love us, that understand us. But we also need to have people that are like Onesimus in our life, that we are reaching out to. And sometimes that, that barrier is them and us. It's a broken relationship that we have with them. But oftentimes, it's their broken relationships with other people. And church, we are called, just like Christ extended his hands on the cross in an act of sacrifice, of reconciliation, we are called in the same way to be ambassadors of reconciliation, where we stretch ourselves out. And you know what? That might mean that we get ourselves in some sticky situations some less than ideal situations, just like Paul did in reaching out to this runaway slave. Church, I want to ask you the question today, who are your hands reaching out to and around? Who are you embracing? Is it just a bunch of people that are like Tychicus? Or are you reaching out to people like Onesimus? Are you acknowledging the brokenness and the baggage and the frustration? Are you doing the pity picks? I kind of spoke negatively about that, but that's really what we're talking about. Are you going to, not pitying people, but reaching out to those people and choosing to interact with them, choosing them to bring them on your team, if you will? Are you believing in them? Are you loving them? Because that's what Christ has done for us. If you're here today and you're separated from God, you're not in relationship with him, it says it right here on the screen, be reconciled to God. Romans 10 says that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. A couple of verses later, it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's a simple response just to call on the name of the Lord and you can enter into relationship with him. And for those of us who are believers in the room today, let's join in the ministry of reconciliation. Let's be ambassadors. You know, we can kind of bemoan or complain about the big moral issues of our day and the problems that are in our world. Uh, we can try to attack it from the outside or, or force a, a structural change, or we can do what Jesus and what the Apostle Paul modeled for us, and we can subvert it by being agents of reconciliation with the people that you come in contact with every day, your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, and your family members. Who are your hands extended to? Is it people like Tychicus? Is it people like Onesimus? Church, I think it needs to be both. It was our honor to play a small role in what God is doing in and through your life. And we would love to continue that journey with you. To find out what your next steps could be in your relationship with Christ, check out bethaltochurch.com slash next. Thanks for joining us again, and we'll see you next time.